for Robots Radio presents The Cyberduck Lorecast. Welcome to the Cyberpunk Lorecast, where style is just as important as substance. Welcome to the podcast where we explore the lore, news, and gameplay of the cyberpunk games and other dystopian worlds. I'm your host, Robots. Yeah, see, Logan, I still haven't fixed the intro. It, just, it only says me still. <laughs> it's all about it's all about me. Anyway, I say it's not all about me because today we have some very special guests. Welcome to the Cyberpunk Lorecast. I'm your host, Tom, or Robots, and I'm here with my co-host, Logan, as usual. Logan, it's an exciting day, buddy. You excited? It is. I am excited. I'm very excited. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very excited. Um, <laughs> I, I love that Borat came out with the second movie because now I can quote Borat again without sounding like I'm just way out of touch with what's currently oh, in the. Man. You know, I'm I'm excited. Um, but it why is it a, why is it an exciting day? Well, to, for two reasons. This is we're doubling up. One, we have this is our first cyber upgrade patron episode and we have our buddy here kather joining us for this episode kather welcome how how are you how's it going fine good good and um this is something we're going to be doing monthly so anybody who signs up on patreon as a a cyber upgrade person (laughs) uh I don't know the words to actually describe that correctly, but if you the second tier, the higher tier gets to join us at the end of every month to talk about cyberpunk and whatever topics that we want. And so the reason why we're kicking it off this week is because of our very special guest, Cody Pondsmith. Cody, welcome to the show. How are you? Excellent. Excellent. I'm happy to be here and uh, excited to answer some questions. Talk yeah. about some stuff. Yeah, we're excited to have you. Um, can you give uh, for those of our audience who might be a little bit more familiar with the video game side of stuff and not really the Artelsorian role play the tabletop side of, of things? Can you can you give our audience a little bit of a I don't know, like an elevator introduction, elevator pitch introduction? Is that a thing? Um, you know, elevator pitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who are you, and, and who are you, and why are you super cool? <laughs> so, uh, I'm Cody Pondsmith. I am the general manager at Artel Story and Games, and also one of the designers on uh, Cyberpunk Red. Um, so, the 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 short version is that. Uh, we are the company that created Cyberpunk 2013, 2020, and now Cyberpunk Red. Um, who or we're sort of the the originator of the world that 2077 is built in. We worked very closely with CD Projekt to create or help create 2077, and it's all one continued timeline. So we actually go all the way from our first game, uh, which was released back in the 90s, um, back in the 80s, actually, I believe, Cyberpunk, which was referred to as 2013, all the way up to where we are now with Cyberpunk Red, which takes place in 2045, and then forward to 2077. Very cool. Very cool. Um, we've been doing the show for a while now, and uh, we haven't had someone of your caliber yet on the show. And so this is very exciting. Um, we uh, so in order to set up the show, I put out some feelers out onto social media and uh, announced it on on earlier episodes of the show and we had some of you guys send in your questions so this episode we'll have a mix of some of your questions some of our questions kather here is uh going to kick us off with one of his questions and when we get to toward the end of the show if you are in the live chat and again we are live on twitch.tv slash robots radio we're doing this episode a little bit early today in order to accommodate everyone but normally we are on sunday nights at 9 p.m eastern 6 p.m pacific so if you'd like to join us for a few Future episodes of this show live then that's the place to do it and if you want to join me for playing some cyberpunk in the future uh, 2077 when that comes out that's where to do it as well so let's kick this off Kather you have a question um, to begin with what what are you what are you wondering f- for uh, our friend Cody here I was wondering what his main build or just his favorite build for was either uh, cyberpunk red uh, red cyberpunk 13 just all around cyberpunk what's your go-to what's your go-to build do you have one um i the thing is i really don't 
uh, Cyberpunk is the the TRPG is is a game that gives you a lot of options to build a lot of stuff. I, I was back in a 2020 game as a fixer, so like a sort of middleman, uh, you know, the guy who gets the gets the information, gets the goods, does the deals, stuff like that. But uh, I started out making uh, fal- uh, false IDs and ended that game as a bioterrorist making horrible, horrible aerosol toxins that I fired out of a grenade launcher. <laughs> That's um, amazing. <laughs> but uh, in red, I, I've been fascinated by uh, we have we have this cyborg, uh, which are internal linear frames, mm-hmm. which are it's basically like implanting a, a metal sort of sort of like an exoskeleton under your skin uh which raises your body four points above human uh like top end um and then we have a number of what we call borg weapons effectively which are weapons that require you to have that like super high body so i've been toying around with the idea of making a character who has that internal linear frame they're just like huge they can flip cars and they've also got uh there's a number of cool ones my favorite being the um the Rhine Metal EMG railgun, which is just this like enormous handheld railgun that's super cool because it ignores any level of armor below eleven, which is like half the armor in the game. Wow! Wow! <laughs> <laughs> Makes anyone Swiss cheese. Yeah, <laughs> man. Okay, very cool. <laughs> so you're going to? Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like you, obviously you know the mechanics of the game very well. So you're you're pushing the boundaries of like this min maxing system in a way in order to create these characters that really can, I don't know, <laughs> flip cars and you know tear people up pretty yeah. pretty bad. Wow. So these are very combat oriented too. So we're not talking, you know, net runners and stuff like that. We're talking like real world mess you up mess your meat so I, space up kind of people i i i grew up playing 2020 um and the thing about cyberpunk is that i would say in in certain circumstances more even than any other game no matter what you're playing you want your character to be capable of some amount of combat mm-hmm. the 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 fixer character i was talking about who I, who's named hornet uh who's actually one of the major characters in red uh, really started out as just like a guy who who made false IDs and ran drugs from time to time, and he had a handgun and a cyberarm. But yeah, as as the game progressed and we started dealing with nastier and nastier stuff, I was like, okay, well, I need to start making sure that I'm not going to get killed off by by whatever happens in Night City. Yeah. So it's it's really this interesting balance of creating a character that's like capable of combat but also capable of other things it freaks me out because i'm actually going to be in a game with my wife my wife is a terrible min maxer but she has this weird penchant for playing like weird she's hit that level of role player where she starts playing weird character concepts Uh so she's playing a fixer right now who's like a really really good fixer like just really good at making deals and manipulating people but she has like Base almost the lowest body stat possible and no <laughs> combat skills and no weapons. And I'm like, I am going to have to protect you 24 seven. You do realize that. Right. But right. on the other hand, but on the other hand, the great part about the fixer is that she's on there. She's, she's, she's like, she is the guy who knows a guy. So we're going through a situation and she's like, Oh, we need a heavy hitter. So she like calls up a contact she has in one of the local gangs is like, we'll give you a thousand dollars if you get down here and, and back us up. So she's got this like huge web of contacts, but is absolutely useless in combat. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Kind of like a, a mastermind character. Who's, who's physically uh, almost yeah, probably even, um <laughs> limited you know like somebody who has i don't know some yeah. sort of physical uh problems that <laughs> keep them from even being able to do normal stuff it's almost what that sounds like um you you brought up a concept in here the the idea that a character you designed became a character in cyberpunk red is that is that common are, are a lot of these characters that you know a, a lot of people have come to this game because of the the video game coming out so they've learned about Johnny Silverhand or uh, Morgan yeah, a, a number of these different characters did those characters originate as role play characters in your own campaigns and eventually became characters in in the actual books how did that start 
So that's a lot. That's a lot more the case for red. Um, there, cause we have a whole section in red about, you know, key figures in night city. Cause we really wanted to mm-hmm. flesh out night city and make it, you know, night city. We always say is another character in cyberpunk. Um, as far as, as far as the old key characters from 2013 and 2020, um, most people think that Morgan Blackhand, uh, the world's greatest solo, is Mike's personal character, but he actually isn't. Um, mm-hmm. He is a character that Mike really loves and and has put a lot of work and thought into. But um, Mike has always said that his personal character is um, is the Ripper Doc uh, Ripper Jack, I believe, who shows up throughout 2020 in like sidebars and stuff. Ah, ah. Um, <laughs> that's where the so, rules come in, right? Yeah. So most of the <laughs> most of the key characters, with the exception of like Spider Murphy, was uh, Lisa's Lisa's personal character. Uh, oh. But most of the characters were like created for the setting, and in a lot of places, uh, they were specifically created to show off different factions or factors of the city. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So when it like, comes, oh sorry, go ahead, uh, keep going. Well. Johnny, for instance, was created, to my understanding, Johnny was created for Never Fade Away, and Never Fade Away was created to give people a feeling of what cyberpunk was. So it was really like almost this like example character that took on a life of their own. Cool, cool. So let's talk about Cyberpunk Red then. The characters yeah. that show up in Cyberpunk Red, were all of them characters that came about through your own role playing, or were some of them just designed as characters you would write into a story? just for red um it's it's an interesting mix we have some characters who are old characters from our games you know hornet is one of them uh his bodyguard fox is another one that was actually me and lisa's characters in a cyberpunk game we were in a while ago uh Uh, there are i think three characters in the um in the sort of section about people in night city who are characters from other people that we know um, from their cyberpunk games. And then there's a, a sort of mix of characters that we put in, like, to show specific things. Uh, my favorite example is um, actually two characters. We have one character uh, called Woodchipper, who was created by our one of our designers, James Hutt, uh-huh. who is this, this huge... Um, very cybered up. She's got a, an internal linear frame, so she's like huge and able to flip cars and stuff. This is very <laughs> cybered up nomad who lives on the outskirts of the city, and she has a garage where she basically settles disputes between different people, uh, especially among nomads. Uh, so we nice. had her in there as just this cool character that you could run across or you know maybe get jobs from or that you could wind up encountering if you were in the outskirts of Night City and something was starting to go really, you know, really sideways as it were but then there's also the other side of that is a a net runner named recluse um who is this like super enigmatic net runner nobody really knows their background all they know is that they're this like master hacker who lives in a heavily fortified abandoned mini mall in the ruins of old japan town uh-huh. so they're really designed as like this they could be a major antagonist if you have like a net running your party. They could even be like a mentor figure, or they could just be like, you know, you you do a, a job for a corp or something, and that corp gets, you know, like a chip, for instance, and they need to get into the chip, but the chip's, you know, heavily, heavily guarded or something of the like. So you need to go to Recluse to like get their help in this and that can lead to betrayal or it can lead to, you know, making friends or whatever. So we wanted to get a mix of like well-loved characters from us and people around us and also new characters that really like fit in a very specific place in the world, as well as moving forward old characters um, like the fixer fireman who is the was in 2020 and still is in red. The, uh, He's basically this ex-veteran fixer who became the best known and and most powerful weapons dealer in Night City. Nice. So we get to kind of talk about what happened to him. We get to kind of talk about where he is after the Fourth Corporate War and during the time of the Red. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Play out the uh, character development a little bit more. 
Um, but that's, yeah. that's really cool because I would imagine that by having characters that have been role played that you've already kind of fleshed them out a lot, you know, they, yeah. they, they've been lived in a little bit. And so by the time they end up in the actual pages of the, you know, the books, you know who they are. They've, you know, you've, you've walked around, you've walked around in their shoes, you know, um, that's, that's a really neat way to, to work that stuff in. I think that's really, really cool. Um, Logan, did you want to toss a question in here? You can pull one of them off the list if you want. Yeah, um, I was actually kind of curious because you're, you're kind of talking about how a lot of the people that work on in the campaigns that you guys have uh, end up in the game as, as different things. Uh, how, do you, how do you approach uh, diversity and, and inclusiveness with creating characters for Cyberpunk Red? And how does that translate into uh, making sure that that kind of representation or maybe those characters themselves are hopefully in 2077? It's an interesting question. Generally, the way we look at it um, is that Night City is. So we've always said Night City is sort of like this, this like dark future Casablanca sort of situation. And part of that is that Night City is a like tremendously multicultural, um, you know, city. Uh, people are coming there from literally all over the place. Um, we have a character in there named Green Thumb, who is the, he is like a first generation American citizen. His parents were um, uh, effectively not refugees from Nigeria, but when things started getting kind of weird with the high riders and with the various corporations trying to, trying to build or destroy the mass drivers in Africa, they left and came to night city. And so we have, you know, a green thumb is there sort of as this first generation American character. Um, So we, we kind of try to keep in mind that people are coming to night city from everywhere. And of every sort of, you know, mentality. Um, there's something, there's something very cool in, in certain respects to the world of cyberpunk, because for a lot of things, um, especially when it comes to, um, you know, perhaps people who are transgender and stuff like that, we have this amazing level of technology that allows for like dealing with things on levels beyond what we have now um you know we are at a point in in, uh we're at a point in in 2045 where if you are transgender for instance you can go into a a hospital and pay a actually fairly small sum of money and get a a full gender conversion uh with no humanity loss or anything like that and basically be out the same day so we, we, we're trying to sort of play with that in some places. We just really mostly try to keep in mind that the diversity of Night City means that there are going to be a lot of diverse characters in Night City. So we kind of had an eye to that when we were trying to build out the, the key characters in the setting. And sort of when we're trying to, to build out things relating to the people of Night City. And I've seen a, a fair amount of that in, in 2077. Um, <clears throat> just sort of carrying forward this this really super multicultural kind of vibe in the city. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah. It, it's nice to see that the kind of the the, the scope of, of what people, especially the gangs themselves, the gangs themselves all tend to have their own culture. But it's clear that Night City feels like this huge mel- melting pot in the world and it's it's exciting to see that because i feel like a lot of people are going to find something that they can latch on to that they feel a connection with and and uh I'm, I'm very curious to see just like with how social situations are in present day uh how that f- kind of f- leeches into uh what we make as far as like content creators and, and designers of games and stuff and I'm, I'm constantly interested in seeing like are there going to be uh you know like uh, uh places where players can if, if they want to instead of doing a, a rock concert to assault arasaka tower if they could do a uh a, a march against a, a corporation uh because of a, a lack of diversity or a lack of uh empathy towards a diverse group things like that 
actually, one of the super cool things that we wound up doing was actually this interesting byplay between Life Path and the the Fixer. Coming back to the Fixer again. Um, I don't know how familiar people are with the concept of Life Path, but one of the things that we did in in 2020 that we carried forward because it's a big key part of our character our character creation in most of our systems is Life Path, which is a series of roles that you make that aren't technically mandatory, but they help you flesh out your character, figure out where they're from, what they're like, what their family is like, that sort of thing. And the first role you make in in Life Path in Red is your cultural origin, your general cultural region, um, which we spent, I, it's not going to be super great, but I'll pull it up here. We spent <laughs> this huge amount of time going through and, uh, you know, obviously keeping in mind that we had to keep it on a D10, um, we established your you pick your you you pick or roll your general cultural region, and those are North American, South and Central American, Western European, Eastern European, Middle Eastern slash North African, Sub-Saharan African, South Asian, Southeast Asian, East Asian, and Oceania or Pacific uh, Islander. And then within that, your character inherently knows a language at a certain level, which we spent a lot of time like looking up what the most spoken languages in each of those regions were based on, you know, what is the most spoken, what are the most, you know, the 10 most spoken languages in Southeast Asia, right? you know, what are the, what are the most spoken languages in, in, you know, Oceania. So we did all of that. And then because your character inherently speaks this sort of pigeon uh, English of Night City, which once again comes from it being this super multicultural region, you all sort of have a common, but you also have this, you you have a sort of tie to your sort of cultural region. And then the cool thing about the Fixer is that because Fixers work as sort of the the operators and the grease of the wheels of Night City, one entire section of your, your role ability, your special ability, is uh, called Grease. And what Greece does is that it allows you to start blending in with other cultures. So, like, you may be of, you know, South African heritage. You may sort of understand that. You may have come to Night City at some point. But as a fixer, you're getting to know all of these different cultures and dealing with all of these different kinds of people. So you may start working in, you know... Um, old Chinatown, and you might start sort of picking up a bit of sort of an understanding of Chinese culture, as well as starting to pick up like Mandarin, for instance. Right, right. So you start you start reflecting the multicultural nature of Night City by becoming sort of widely multicultural yourself and understanding more and more different sort of groups of people. Yeah, and then you're probably more <laughs> accepted into those different groups because you can at least speak a little bit or understand some of their language and their culture. And you, you, now you are blending more easily with different groups. That's that's really yeah. cool. I, I, I mean, it's part of how uh, the real world world works. You know, if if you can, when you travel to a new location and somebody speaks a different language, if you can speak the language and you can even do it in a way that they do it, then you're way more accepted than if you're if you don't. There's like that is just <laughs> like as humans, this is a there's a big gap when you just don't speak the language. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's that's really cool. Well, I've got some questions from some of our, our listeners and viewers, and I want to make sure that we knock some of these out. So um, and we only have you for so long. So I want to make sure that we, we jump through some of these. So uh, the first one on the list is from Josh Sawyer, who who writes in and says, if cyberpunk hadn't been created Why? until 2020, oh. you, you all right, Kather? Kather's having yeah, internet so issues. Yeah, sorry. Am I it's, back? it's all right. Um, so John Sawyer says, uh, if Cyberpunk hadn't been created until 2020, how do you think it would differ from the game we now know? And that's 2020 in the real world. So originally Cyberpunk's, you know, was written and started in the 80s and 90s. If this was launched instead a few decades later, would we end up with a very different game? So the weird part about it is... I think the answer is simultaneously yes and no. I feel like the hmm, I feel like that the the like coat of paint on it would be different. I think it would probably have a little bit less of the sort of the the eighties vibe that you know certain aspects of cyberpunk definitely have. Mm -hmm. um, I don't necessarily know what would replace that. Um, since I think it's always kind of hard to figure out what the like. 
I think it's always kind of hard to figure out what things people are going to latch onto from your decade while you're in that decade. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Cause it's all just in the now at that moment. Right. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, you know, I think to some extent the, the foundation of cyberpunk would be basically the same. Um, I, I think that, you know, maybe there's a there's a chance there would be some some change in how we we sort of deal with cyberware from like 2020 and 2013 but you know we're we're generally quick to say that you know to some extent most of the stuff that deals with you know cyberware and humanity and stuff like that is first and foremost a game mechanic to keep you from becoming a horrifying death machine <laughs> um right? you know we spent a lot of time kind of re 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 readjusting how we describe the, this you know cyber psychosis and humanity loss and cyberware in red to kind of make people to, to make it clear what we were kind of going for because there were a lot of people who were like didn't totally get what we were what mike was originally going for um but the the core i think the core foundation of cyberpunk i think a lot of the reason that people are very excited for it right now is that it still resonates really well right now um mm-hmm. and a yeah. lot of that comes down go ahead i, I, I was oh. gonna just add in real quick that uh, maybe even more so <laughs> because of, yeah because um, there are certain aspects to the original st- i mean the stuff written and and we've talked about this on the show the the original core books and the way that they um anticipated the future of the world although this is a dark future and it's a you know it's it breaks off of our our current time stream but there are there are certain things that it was very predictive of in some ways and that we are seeing the world kind of head towards and some of that is actually pretty scary so yeah i mean it it stays very relevant well, for sure a lot of that comes down to the fact that to to some extent cyber but as much as like as much as it's soaked in in neon and and you know cyberware and you know whatnot uh, c- cyberpunk really is to some extent an alternate an alternate history um you know i think what maybe a lot of people don't know is that mike when mike lays down the foundation for a new cyberpunk book he does a like a ridiculous amount of of both historical and sort of real world research you know um a lot of a lot of the stuff in red is borne out from Mike doing weeks and weeks of research on like what would happen if certain certain aspects of of global trade were wiped out mm-hmm. or like what would happen if the internet were wiped out so a lot of it is because it's based on a certain amount of historical research you know they they say you can you can better predict the future if you study the past so yeah. you know a lot of things move in in reads. So a lot of it, I think, just comes down to the the amount of like research and work that Mike puts into building the world. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's true. I mean, we humans we make the same mistakes over and over again. We you know they're just in different settings, but the the human reactions yeah. and the social situations just recur over and over and over. Um, very cool. Let's let's move on to another question. We have one from uh, Nova. This was Actually, on our. I'm um, sorry. I was going to say you were speaking of settings. I was I was curious. We got a uh, one of your questions in there uh, oh, about sure. settings. That yeah, actually ties in really well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's that's a good segue. Um, we've heard a lot about Night City because obviously it's it's like a character in in these games. Um, if you were if you were to break out of Night City and set a yeah. campaign. In an alternate setting, where uh-huh. would you go? What would what would be a, a really cool alternate setting to Night City? Okay, are we talking like another place in the cyberpunk world, or yes. are we talking? Okay, yes. Um, so yeah, you you could go to Night City. You could go to the Badlands. I mean, there's lots of other cities though. There's I mean, you know, there's space. There's all sorts of places you could go <laughs> in the cyber. Like so, if you're setting, it, let's say it's Cyberpunk Red. It's 2045. <laughs> what would be another alternate setting? To run a cyberpunk so campaign. Interesting, interestingly enough, uh, I've wanted to do this for a while. Um, my alternate setting would be um, actually somewhere near Nigeria or Central Africa. 
um, because it is it's this very interesting setting with a lot going on. We don't talk about it as much in the core book because, you know, we give an overview of the world and we talk about yeah. Night City because, you know, it is sort of the core location for cyberpunk, though we do give enough information for people to build, you know, campaigns other places. But the cool thing about that area is that sort of in the wake of um, in the wake of the, the building of the mass drivers, which are the big orbital elevators that let people to get stuff up into space, um, that area is this weird mix of like very, very high tech as corporations have come in and sort of spread high technology through the area and sort of lower tech areas uh, with this big, like the big key point being the orbital mass driver, which is like this weirdly contested zone because on one hand you have, you know, a bunch of people who want to take control of it because it gives a, a tremendous amount of sort of uh, power back and forth, especially uh, among people dealing with the high riders, the high riders being this organization of people who were primarily like, People who worked in space, but eventually broke off from the people they were working for, as it were. And the High Riders themselves, who are this really cool, like, sort of entirely based in space culture. Um, so it gives this very interesting... I've always thought it would be interesting to play a campaign in that region where, like, maybe the initial thrust of the game is that you're, like hired by either the high riders or by a corporation to protect one of the mass drivers. And then like, maybe there's some like, like conspiracy type thing that spirals out of that or something of the like, or dealing with sort of their local regions. Cause while a lot of, a lot of Africa in 2045 has sort of banded together into what we call the pan African Alliance, which was founded when, um, one of the corp, well, a number of corps came into Africa and basically started, uh, you know, uprooting things to build the mass drivers. A bunch of the Central African nations came together and said, well, no one of us is going to be able to stop them from doing this. But together, we can actually, you know, bring enough, uh, enough power to bear to make this a fair negotiation, as yeah. it were. Yeah. So I've always thought that would be a very interesting sort of setting to place it in because it's also you know, very different from like stylistically, it's very different from night city in certain aspects. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure you would end up with a lot of African culture being the, the predominant culture, but of course, like you were saying, there, there's going to be some mix, uh, different cultures coming in who want to, uh, take over the region, uh, compete for the mass drivers, other resources. Um, Interesting. Very cool. Let's move on to a question we have from uh, Nova on Discord, who writes, um, how legal are weaponized implants, mantis blades, wolvers, things like that? Do you need a permit or can anyone get them or are they straight up illegal? Um, so that is that is a bit of a difficult one. Um, we don't tend to talk about it very much in cyberpunk because um, you know, all of your characters are edge runners and therefore you don't necessarily care as it were. Right. Um, you know, you're going to, you're going to do it. What have you? Um, I think technically uh, the full on, like well, like scratchers, which are the the, the sharpened fingernails, uh, are fine. Stuff like that. I I believe that technically, when you start getting up to wolvers and you know the big damage implanted cyberware, I think it's technically illegal, um, because a lot of that stuff is coming out of like stolen military hardware and stuff like that. Right. But uh, the sort of difficult part about that in Night City is that there's still, while there are technically police in Night City, um, Night City is not well policed, as it were. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, and in a lot of cases, even the police that do police Night City may not necessarily care if you look like you're going to be too much of a threat and or not worth their time. Uh, you know, there are plenty of people wandering around Night City with, you know, rippers or, you know, any number of implanted bits of cyberware. And people don't tend to take a lot of notice, 
maybe once you start getting up to like implanted uh, grenade launchers and stuff like that, people will start taking more notice. But like, <laughs> there is still to some extent a certain amount of lawlessness in Night City that pervades how people deal with it. Yeah, I'm. I'm sense. curious. You talk about uh, everyone being an edge runner. Um, I haven't gotten to dive through all of all of Red, but I'm. I'm curious. Can you touch on uh, the the lawman role and how that applies if if you're running with a bunch of edge runner edge runners, but you're kind of in this position where you're still working with a lot of the the uh, Night City Police Department, um, especially just kind of given their their role ability being able to call back up wouldn't it be kind of weird to have a bunch of ed run- edge runners with you if you call in a bunch of police and they're like oh well you're with a bunch of people who have a whole bunch of illegal mods that that we could just take them in but you're like trying to call in a favor so the the main thing we did with lawmen moving from cops in in 2020 is that we kind of expanded what they are um so as a as a lawman you are you are a lawman no matter what you are as long as you are somebody who is basically an enforcer of the law um so that ranges from the official night city police department uh you could play a lawman who is with a corporation as corporate police you could play a lawman who is with um uh, danger girl which is a detective agency which also does some law enforcement um i would in my games i generally even let people do that if they're at the level of like um for instance the sixth street which shows up in in 2077 as a a a more malevolent gang but in 2045 is still sort of the good guys they're like a local sort of self-policing organization that just happens to be becoming more of a protection racket as they go so what we generally see in lawmen is that it it kind of depends where you are but in a lot of cases um you might be working with the other players for any number of reasons uh ranging from you're not getting paid enough as a police officer um and maybe when you call in backup you give them perhaps not the whole story of what's going on you may be working with the uh, you may be working with the the other players because they are useful to you in some operation. We have a lot of edge runners who play vigilante, and at that point, if you call in backup, the backup is in this kind of era much more willing to work with you if you're playing vigilante than take you in, as it were. Mm-hmm. The the Night City Police Department can use all the help they can get maintaining <laughs> some amount of order in Night City. Right, they're like, thanks for your help. Uh, you made a little bit of a mess, but uh, we won't hold it against you. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and I think that there's also something to be said for uh, in perhaps less legal campaigns, you could straight up be a, a dirty cop. You know, you could be, you know, in the in the campaigns where you're more just like generally sowing chaos and, and taking what you want. It could be that you are in there effectively either with a bunch of other dirty cops or manipulating the system to get what you need as it were. Yeah, you you call in you call in backup, but maybe you don't explain exactly what the situation is maybe you don't mention that you were the one who started the firefight with the corporates or maybe you <laughs> you don't explain that you were the one that stole the uh, the van that you're currently driving away from from you know the boosters on right or you're actually a fixer in the whole situation and and manipulating everyone against each other yeah <laughs> Yeah. Is, is that a situation where uh, you'd be able to kind of have like as you kind of level up and, and take on different uh, aspects like you were talking about, you know, uh, modding your your solos or your uh, fixers so that you could actually do more combat. Could a lawman then kind of uh, take on more of a fixer role to, to try and like do some some document uh, crafting so that they can kind of like, you know, make up some fake permits for some of the uh, the mods that their their other edge runner teammates might have kind of that situation absolutely um one of the cool things about cyberpunk is we have three we have three methods of character creation um and at the last method which we we call the complete package Mm -hmm. you basically build out everything about your character from the ground up and the great part about that is you can build a lawman who is maybe more of a detective or something like and you can pick where all your skill points go um 
So you could start as a cop who's really good at falsifying, you know, criminology reports and stuff like that, or really good at working the bureaucracy so you can get exactly what you need. So you can actually do that at the start of, of character creation, if that's what you want to do. <laughs> and if you, th if you were like, if you started out as like a really like paladin, you know, I'm not going to do anything illegal and then things, you know, go south, you could build your character into that over time by leveling up those skills instead of leveling up other skills. And then if you wanted to go further, um, you could actually, we, we added in 2045 the ability to multi-class into other roles. So while you would effectively be, technically you would be, you would be treated as more leaving the force, you could go from being a lawman to being a fixer, and you could start being a fixer in Night City and get, uh, get access to the fixer's role ability operator. Um, and... The assumption would be made that basically, while you've moved on to being a fixer, you still have contacts within law enforcement, which is basically you are sort of like any good uh, team action film. You're <laughs> able to call up your buddies from the force to say, hey, it's off the books, but I need you to, to help me out with this. Right, and, you know. Cool. You got some buddies on the force who will come back you up, as it were. <laughs> and they're like, "You're paying? Okay, we got, we're, we're there." Yeah, that's cool. I like that. I, I was wondering if you could kind of, kind of retain some of that, that history and have that character arc with, with your own character and, and take on like different roles to be able to, uh, to, to manipulate how, how the world gets played out because you've, you've made this, this story decision, and it actually works out in your favor in the, in, in. Uh, the red as well too i like that absolutely absolutely cool hey kather do you have any other questions you'd like to pitch uh that's a question i i think i asked on the discord before but um with uh your trauma team uh i don't know if you read the comics uh and i don't want to spoil anything about it, but say you were uh, uh nefarious and you do or see the fair nef nefarious yeah that's the word nefarious is a word yeah sure like a nefarious character and you broke in somewhere to steal or you killed someone could you could you technically in cyberpunk uh red use trauma team to get out if you had the card you paid your insurance high enough so the thing about trauma team is that on one hand there are a lot of there t in 2045 there are a lot of trauma teams um trauma team international which is what it used to be in in 2020 has broken up into a bunch of like smaller trauma teams across the world um but yeah um like if you were in so the the crux of that is two part the first part is trauma team doesn't inherently know what you were doing when you got shot they just know <laughs> that you got shot right um so if if you get almost gunned down you know robbing a corporate compound trauma team is going to show up because you snapped your card and you said, I'm dying, please come save me. Um, I fell and, and I can't extent, get up. <laughs> yeah, to some extent, if you click your life alert, Trauma Team doesn't really <laughs> care. You're paying the money, you continue to pay the money, so they will show up uh, regardless of almost any situation. I would say there's a certain amount of GM fiat to that of like, if you decide, if you if you decide that like you're gonna you're gonna travel to the to the west coast and or east coast and break into the White House and kill President Kress, <laughs> then like maybe the trauma team is gonna show up at the White House and be like, hold on a minute, wait a minute, this no, is, turn this, around. <laughs> this is probably gonna get us in more trouble than if we just leave this guy. So like. I would say GM Fiat, if you're really obviously doing something that Trauma Team would get in legal hot water trying to save you from, they might not come in, but Trauma Team doesn't generally care as long as you can pay. So I, I'm just going to put this out there. I hope we get advertisements at some point for Trauma Team that look like Life Alert ad advertisements from like 20 years ago. <laughs> And somebody's like <laughs> trips and falls and then is like, I can't get up. Trauma team. And then hits the button. 
it snaps the card the fucking the roof the roof explodes um, yeah. and three yeah. three people in in heavy SWAT outfits <laughs> paracord down right right like and it's just an old lady who like t- twisted her leg coming down the stairs yeah yeah <laughs> they get they get grandfathered in from the original the original program they're like well we still have that life alert but uh it's trauma <laughs> team now so you're you're in the system forever yeah, yeah uh, life alert and, life alert uh, purchased uh some franchises of trauma team in order to uh, to kind of keep up with the times man that's a great image that would be a really funny t-shirt <laughs> you also have to worry about who you attack though too because if you attack someone with trauma team you're gonna get screwed over by trauma team oh yeah well trauma trauma team trauma team in red <laughs> is especially bad because a they show up in an av4 so they're going to fly in with air superiority and the av4 in, inherently has a mounted uh a mounted machine gun oh. on the bottom of it wow which yeah. It's only going to hit one of you at a time, but they can choose to be at whatever range they want, which means they can choose the best range for their machine gun. And at that point, unless you can dodge bullets, you're going to be taking a lot of damage. <laughs> it's like you you shoot one guard just in the knee, just like just to prove a point, and then he has life alert, and then SWAT. Yeah. On the other hand, on the other hand, um, trauma team is very expensive. Yeah. Um. We we actually this is the first time we've kind of played around more with actual like uh, living cost type stuff. So on top of if you want if you want trauma team, you're going to be paying for that on top of paying for food and paying for housing, which is already pretty steep. Yeah, you have to get a corporation or something to get it. Yeah, actually, one of the fun parts is we. <laughs> We like to say that the the executive special ability is being better than everyone else, um, <laughs> and at a certain point, they get they get a trauma team membership for free because their corporation gets it for them. Yeah, they get, yeah. They money, get health money, care. Money, money. It's a perk. Yeah, it's it's a it's a, a signing bonus. You know. <laughs> yeah. Totally. That's they get great. a free apartment in in a nice district, and they get health care. Yeah. <laughs> health care. Yeah. <laughs> life alert i just pictured the t-shirt I, I want somebody to design this t-shirt i love when when some of our listeners design stuff but I, I want like the old lady at the bottom of the stairs like snapping her card and then trauma team like <laughs> para dropping like through the window <laughs> to help her guns out guns ablate yeah. guns ready yeah. At yeah. The <laughs> she's like i can't fall in and i can't get up trauma team um Perfect. Oh, that would be amazing. You guys were talking yes. earlier about uh, setting up, making some T-shirts for um, selling. Uh, we've, we're coming up with ideas for you. You should put these out there. Uh, <laughs> so they send them over. Yeah. Have, like, no, no matter how small the wound, will like on the back. Right, right, right. Yeah, like oh, I got a splinter. Trauma team. Um, the little kid falls over and scratches their knee. Trauma right, team. Trauma team. Or like the bully pushes him down on the playground, and the trauma team shows up to kick the bully's butt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that'd be great. Um, speaking speaking of bullies and um, shades of gray, <laughs> because uh, this world okay. is is very very shades of gray, right? There's, I mean, yeah. everything's gray. Um, I've got a question. If you were to if you were to pick out any character in the in the lore, uh-huh. who would be the closest yeah. to a white knight? Somebody who is genuinely oh. good, or at least intentions are good. That is actually that is actually pretty easy. Um, so we have a character. They're mentioned in in the core book. Um, they're one of the uh, one of the the notable badasses in the in the back of the book. Um, that's that's the and, section. Notable badasses. That's the title of the second. Oh, it is actually badasses of Night City. Yeah. There you go. Um, so I hope, uh, I hope you're going to pick the person I want. But go ahead. I don't think I am. Um, <laughs> Dylan, Dylan Murphy. Oh, uh, Dylan Murphy. Dylan Murphy is another character. Uh, it was Lisa's character a while ago, and he is a, uh, a soft-spoken middle-aged solo at this point with a, a actually like a reputation for being a, a sort of white knight solo he basically protects people uh sort of equalizer asks my understanding basically helps uh sort of the downtrodden in night city he is at least partially based out of uh one of the only remaining churches in night city um 
Father Kevin's church's church, uh, Holy Angels Church, which is a, a Catholic church in the little Europe in Night City. Um, and he is rumored to be an ex uh, IRA gunner who fled to Night City and now sort of literally lives as sort of an equalizer esque um, solo. Uh, who by 2045 may have may have settled down, but still is on the streets from time to time. <laughs> um, less deep lore. Ah, uh, see, that's the problem. I, to some extent, I would almost say Morgan Blackhand, but Morgan Blackhand is no. I would say Morgan Blackhand, but Blackhand is weird because he is a he is a company man, uh, sort of through and through, but he does have. A more he is more moral than probably ninety percent of solos. Um, <laughs> Mike likes to Mike likes to say that basically he got his start in as a solo in Night City because he had already had I believe a military background and he was living in an apartment in sort of an okay part of Night City and there was a uh, a, a woman out in the parking lot being beaten by her by her boyfriend and Morgan went out and basically uh didn't kill the guy but he you know kicked his ass he beat him yeah. more than black and blue and uh, at a certain point he got a reputation for this and Militech showed up and said hey you <laughs> seem to be good at good at this why didn't you sign up um so i yeah less less deep lore i would say i would say morgan though you know, while Morgan is definitely of the like doesn't kill doesn't kill children, you know doesn't kill innocents that sort of thing. He is still a solo, you know. Yeah, yeah. Break your kneecaps. <laughs> Break yeah. your kneecaps. Yeah, don't mess don't mess with Morgan. Cool. Logan, do you have another one you want to highlight? Um, yeah, actually. Uh, so this one kind of relates to um, twenty seventy seven in a way uh, when you guys were were developing the story with Johnny Silverhand in mind as kind of the, the standout uh, companion for, for that game. Um, I'm curious for you personally, uh, what would it take for an AI to be on par with a human uh, as far as like value, as far as like deserving of the rights? Like what does an AI have to do to prove to you that they are sentient and deserving of protection around the same human rights that we have. Personhood. Have, yeah. yeah. Personhood. So, that's a good way to put it. Humanity. Yeah. So like, this is a super complicated one because, uh, so like first little, little bit on the side, the, the soul killer weirds me out to some extent uh -huh. because it weirds me out more than just AI that were accidentally because we in in red we talk about the fact that there are a number of AI that are not soul killed people they were created accidentally or there's a rumor that some AI kind of came into existence just based on the the fact that the old net is weird and sometimes when a lot of data <laughs> comes together in one place something starts you know growing sapience but soul killer weirds me out because a lot of people think of soul killer as like it literally like takes your soul and you know puts it in the internet mm -hmm. but it doesn't you know we we do not say anything about the soul in in cyberpunk we're not that metaphysical so what soul killer does is it copies your brain and then kills you so technically that copy of johnny silverhand is exactly that a copy of johnny silverhand you know if you want to get metaphysical johnny's soul moved on you know, back in 2023, and this is a copy of him. So right. that's what weirds me out about Soul Killer, um, because it's that weird, it's that weird moment of like, at a certain point, uh, someone who is Soul Killed having that realization that like they are technically a copy of a person, but they believe themselves to be that person. And at a certain point, I don't know that that matters, especially if you don't talk about the metaphysical side of things. You know, at, at a certain point, if you're not talking about heaven and hell, that might as well be Johnny. Right. You know, it's it's um, akin to the uh, Star Trek teleporter problem. That's what I was just thinking. Yeah, because technically a teleporter disassembles you, sends the information to somewhere else and then reassembles you with completely different atoms in the same configuration. So basically takes uh, the, the most important part of you being your mind apart 
physically and then reassembles you with all the working parts of your mind, the memories of your mind, all of those things, the same way that Soul Killer would pull that out of your body and put you into a computer program. Um, but yeah, at what there's, point are you not yourself anymore? There's also a new show on like Amazon Prime. I don't remember the name of it, but that you get put into like this cyber world and what they do is technically vaporize your head and scan it. So you, yes. you in the real world die yeah. and technically is that because technically you're technically data. People can mess with your brain. Are you technically still you if someone can mess with it? Right. Right. Like there's been but, books with this too. Like where they, they cut up your brain and scan the brain and you become data. Then technically, are you still you or are you just that data? Right. But jumping all the way back, I, I'm, a, I, I'm, 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 I'm pretty, I'm pretty, uh, I got a soft spot for, for humanity, as it were. Um, <laughs> I would say that for me, like for me as a person, the moment something could be classified as sapient, you know, the, the moment something is capable of creating its own emotions and, you know, having opinions about things at that point, it, it might as well be a person to me, mm -hmm. you know, I think therefore I am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So because at that point, what's the difference and dolphins and apes. Are they people? Yeah, I, <laughs> well, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm curious because a lot of the discussion that's going on with 2077 is, is that Johnny is, is in this bio, this new biochip and, and for all intents and purposes, he is, his body is dead, but we are, we are talking to him in our head as V and I'm just, I'm, I'm, I would, I can't wait to play the game because I can't wait to find out how this story plays out because in my mind, he is, he he doesn't understand anything different about what he is since he still has a goal, a purpose, a drive and a reason to live, even though he's not technically with body. And because of that, I'm like, well, have at least in, in other games like destiny Two, your human soul could be in a robot body and you're an exo. And that's just, you are you, but you are in a robot body or you could go full Borg. And what, what discerns you, from someone who's an AI on, on the net, you know, and it's, and I'm, and I'm curious, just like, where does that, where does that line fall for you, for, for Johnny in this instance, is he an AI? Is he a person? Uh, could, if he was in, you know, in, in a full out board body, if he was transferred with the soul killer to, to something like that, like, would he still be Johnny Silverhand? Well, I mean, it's, it's to some extent it gets more complicated if you take alternate timelines into effect because, you know, Cyberpunk has a few alternate timelines. One of those in Cybergen, Alt manages to perfect what she was originally planning for Soul Killer, and Johnny does get put into another body. Um, and he yeah, is man. Mr. Silverhand in, in Cyberpunk uh, Cyber Generation. And, you know, that is an alternate timeline. That's not what's happening in 2077. But. No, it, it's one of those situations of like at a certain point, I think it stops kind of mattering because the the um, the minuscule detail you would have to go to to even figure that out is so small, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, at a certain sense. point, at a certain point, you know, there is no functional difference between this being Johnny Silverhand or this being a copy of Johnny Silverhand. Yeah, and yeah. Very, if, very. If, if you put him in a body or even in a, um, a, you know, full body conversion type situation, like you've even kind of moved past the point where he could be messed with on like a code level, because in theory, it would be the same as going in and messing with somebody, you know, on a neurological level. So right. at a certain right. point, it kind of stops mattering to me. Yeah. So. Uh, mm -hmm. real, real off the wall question here. If you were to take Johnny's consciousness and put it into a robot body and then give it a human arm, would he now be Johnny human hand? I mean, in theory, yes. Um, it is something you could theoretically <laughs> do. Um, or what if that's the, what if that's the evil nemesis version of Johnny Silverhand is Johnny human it's hand the, and he's full board except for an arm. And that's the only part of this. Johnny. The darkest timeline is that it's Johnny went full body conversion except his except his left arm, which yeah. is still human. Right. And Adam Smasher is a, is an AI that became fully human. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. 
That is that is like the antithesis <laughs> universe. This needs to be this needs to be like if this was a TV show, this would be like a one off episode where they go to some wacko bizarro world and something crazy happens. And, and of course, he's got a goatee. And yes, of yeah. course, he has a goatee. It's, goatee it's, it's a robot goatee, though. So it's like, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what a robot goatee looks it's like. It's painted on. Right? Yeah, it's just paint. magnet. Like Bender, it's magnets. Bender's evil twin. Oh God! <laughs> he can just pull off different magnets of facial hair and just like reattach them if he wants to change the style. Yeah. That little kid game when they like you have the pen and the magnet and the iron shavings. Yes, yes, yeah. And then you brush the iron shavings in order to like direct oh, yes. the hair. Yeah. And just just to shave, you just get something that demagnetizes it. Yeah. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. We're we're writing this stuff for you. You. Sh- I mean, obviously, all three of us need to be hired by our Telsorian. Um. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great stuff um so before we get too much further we're, we're we're already an hour into this i know we've got kind of a hard stop in a little while um wow. chat chat twitch uh, twitch chat chat twitch twitch chat if you guys have any questions at all for cody now would be a good time to start posting those in chat um and do remember that these are mostly about the lore of cyberpunk the cyberpunk world the tabletop rpg cyberpunk red questions would be great um there's only so much cody uh can say at this point that he knows about 2077 and um so like gameplay questions about 2077 probably won't make very much sense right now but um questions about the lore and the world and and those kinds of things would be great characters um well here i, I got a quick you got one i got a quick one go for yeah. it yeah. uh when when is uh when are you are you guys current because you're the general manager i expect this you would know this are you <laughs> okay. are you guys no making are you guys making Hello Cutie Nerf guns that I can get? <laughs> I just, I'm curious because I want to. No, but gun. I deeply want to. <laughs> okay. Trust me, I deeply, deeply want to, but no, we are, we are not currently. Um, oh, that's killer. Now, who okay. knows? Who knows down the line? I'm sure, I'm sure, uh, if we if we give it long enough, somebody will have a somebody will have like a an Etsy 3D model for one, oh, the, and yeah, we can the model, it. yeah. <laughs> the great looking gun. Um, it is. It's Goddamn awesome adorable. and it's hilarious. I love the San Ru. I love. I love the Hello Cutie <laughs> gun. It's hilarious. For for and, those uh, of you who do not have a copy of uh, of Red, this is the San Ru Hello Cutie. It's very cool. It's great. Yeah, it's so adorable. Yeah, that could totally be a Nerf gun. That is, I mean, that right. Yeah, they would make stuff like that, like Overwatch. I think it was like Divas. Uh, they yeah. shoot the little balls instead of the Nerf gun. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's why I want it. That's why I think it's it's a perfect match for Cyberpunk Red. It would be great. Also, whoever made a Zaro, uh, or not Zaro, um, uh, shoot, uh, Zara. Uh, I love that person, and I and I think that they they deserve all the credit in the world because that is definitely my favorite character out of Red so far. Or Black Dog. So that is. Oh, go ahead. One second. I can't remember who did. I'd have to pull. I pull that is up. Angel, and I'm go- I, uh, I'm going to mispronounce her last name. Um, Giafria, I believe. I probably mispronounced that, and I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> if you get a chance to to talk to Angel. Tell them I appreciate that the hell out of that character because that character is awesome. Well, I will. Thank you. Thank you. What's she look like? I still haven't got mine yet. She. Uh, the image is a little bit small, so I'm not sure it would oh. show up super well. Imagine the most badass uh, woman who was born without a left arm and has a cybernetic left arm. She carries a bow with a really awesome quiver on her back. She has a long flowing trench coat that looks straight out of Tron Legacy. It's got like blue highlights. She's got like combat boots, uh, black shirt, uh, black pants. And she's got this really awesome like Dragon Ball Z kind of scanner over her, her left eye that's pink. And she's got long brunette hair that goes back it's she's basically the most badass woman i've ever seen and i and i and she's an actress of all things and also an activist for uh um what is it uh i know she's an activist for dang it what was it it was like yeah is it amputees no it wasn't amputees i'm blanking and that kills me um and don't tell logan's wife that he has a new waifu i do have a new waifu (laughs) that is fair (laughs) 
<laughs> but yeah, she's she's amazing. Uh, actually, all the characters in Black Dog. If you guys haven't gotten a chance to go through Black Dog, go through Black Dog because holy cow. We had a lot of fun with um, with the the as we call them the Cyber Six, a group of a yeah. group of folks we got together with to make to make the actual Cyber Six in in uh, in Black Dog. They were they were a lot of fun. So we have a question uh, here TV from show. chat. Um, Envy okay. Courier writes: Is the world still without knowledge? Has anything been restored since Arasaka wiped it all? Arasaka wiped it all out. That's a um. Go ahead. So. It is somewhat restored. In in red, the issue is finding the information. Um, there is still information, and in a lot of places, you can still sort of access it. But it is an issue of it is an issue of finding it. Um, there are certain certain things like anything that was only ever recorded on the net is going to be. You know, you can find it, but you're going to have to sift through the old net, which is basically suicide, unless you're like an absolute master hacker kind of kind of situation. Um, anything that was like on a chip that wasn't plugged into something, that's fine. Um, anything paper in directly in Night City was wiped out, but there is, to my understanding, there there would be like paper documents other places um so there might actually be something kind of cool to the concept of like having a team that goes you know maybe up into you know, up into washington or oregon or you know out to the other states where uh the whole collapse situation didn't happen as hard you know we didn't have the paper eating virus or anything like that and like bringing back actual like libraries of information to restock the the sort of hard information of night city mm -hmm. um but yeah it's really more as with many things in in cyberpunk red it's not necessarily that it's been 100 percent destroyed it's just that it's harder to find right Right. Please tell me there's a gang out there called the Reclaimers and they're historian buffs just going out trying to. <laughs> I mean, isn't to that a band? Knowledge, back. knowledge is power. Uh, isn't that, I, I would walk you, 500 miles in that, those guys? I will <laughs> tell you so that there is a. I will tell you that there is a faction called the Reclaimers. Um, they are a faction dedicated to rebuilding society along uh, along the U.S. Uh, they they primarily they travel with nomads a lot and they go out to many of the abandoned cities, especially in the Midwest, and basically take old ghost towns that were abandoned either during the collapse or during the Fourth Corporate War and try to sort of rebuild them so that many of the refugees from various places affected by the Fourth Corporate War, the time of the Red, can move to that city and sort of re reclaim that city. So That's actually, cool. I can nice. say that yes, that is a faction. That's yeah, cool. pretty nice. Yeah, they would walk five hundred <laughs> miles and then five hundred more to reclaim a city. Um, we've got another <laughs> they question. Often do. <laughs> they often do. Um, we've got another question. John John the Wise in chat, uh, who who's a content creator. Oh, hey. you guys check out John John stuff. Uh, writes, "What was behind the decision you guys made to sacrifice some realism for the sake of game balance? Twenty twenty was closer to a realism simulator and not as balanced. And Red is still mo still realistic, but takes liberties for the sake of balance." What do you think about that? Um, the primary, the primary thrust on that was that, uh, you know, a lot of we've we've looked around. We've seen that a lot of how people tend to play games in certain areas has sort of shifted, and you know, there are a lot of aspects of of Cyberpunk twenty twenty that were done for the sake of of realism and for um simulationism but that made it really hard for some people to come into the game um or there there are stories of people we we heard stories of people who tried to get into red back or not red tried to get into cyberpunk back in 2020 and it was just you know a little bit too much for them in certain places so what we wanted to do with Red was we wanted to take what was in 2020 and make it more widely accessible so that more people could enjoy it, especially a lot of the people who would be getting into it because of 2077, but still maintain the the feeling of cyberpunk. 
we actually spent a really, really, really long time in, in meetings between me and Mike and James going over like, okay, what, you know, this system is, you know, very complicated. Auto fire is a really good example of that. Mm -hmm. Um, three round burst and auto fire and suppressive fire in 2020 are very realistic. The only thing that I've seen, the only system I've seen that probably does it more realistic, realistic is called Cthulhu. Um, but the sacrifice of that realism is that it requires a lot of, a lot of rolling of dice, a lot of math, a lot of sort of calculation back and forth, which makes it really intimidating to certain people. Um, so we wanted to try and maintain the threat of auto fire. We wanted to maintain like, if you do auto fire, it's going to be very dangerous for the person you're firing on while also streamlining it such that you didn't have, you know, one of two options, which was either new players would get really intimidated and, you know, see that and not want to play and therefore miss out on a bunch of cool stories or, you would go ahead and play and maybe you had a GM who wasn't like super, super used to the system or you had a player that you were trying to bring on. And, you know, the moment they did auto fire, everything would sort of like grind to a halt as they had to, you know, figure out how many bullets hit and then roll dice for all those bullets and then add all the damage and then, you know, compare it against all the armor right. and figure out what was ablated. And it would kind of grind to a halt and stop people from having as much fun. So we still wanted to keep, you know, the the fun feeling of it, but make it run a little bit faster so that it wasn't as intimidating. And so they would continue to run quickly so that people could keep having a good time, even if they weren't like super, super, super used to the system. Right. The pace um, of the pace of the of tabletop RPGs is important, especially for new players. Well, until somebody's really fully bought into the world and, and even the, the group they're playing with. There's, you know, something like a, a rough pace can uh, be a detriment. So I can see that being a, a priority for sure. Um, it was it was really it, we, we tried to walk a fine balance. And I, I'm, I'm deeply hoping that we managed to that we managed to get that balance. There, there are a lot of things that I know people are sad to see go. But I've also seen a lot of people who are really excited by some of the streamlining things that we've done, especially in places like net running. Yeah. So in a similar a similar vein, um, when when it comes to getting somebody into playing for the first time, how what would you recommend they do to get started? Somebody who's who's uh, let's say let's say somebody's interested in cyberpunk they're you know, they're, they're a video gamer and they're like, oh, 2077 is awesome. I've been playing this for a few weeks now. It would be really cool to try the tabletop with some friends. What's the best way to get started? So I think that kind of depends on at what level of role player you are. Um, I would say that if you've like never done a role playing game before in your life, I would pick up our jumpstart kit because it is. Uh, in a lot of places sort of simpler and it kind of is designed to get you into like the concept of it roughly. Um, if you are a group that maybe like plays D and D or any, any other, you know, group of role-playing games, I would probably suggest you pick up. Okay. So there's like two levels here. If you're absolutely not sure, then I would say pick up a copy of the jumpstart kit and, and play with that for like a session and kind of figure out, whether you think that's cool. Um, if you either A, are like absolutely won over and you know you want to play this game, or B, you're not sure, but you would be willing to get something that has like you're big into cyberpunk lore, I would say buy a copy of the core book. There is a ridiculous amount of lore in there, as well as game. Um, so even if you're not super interested in playing the TRPG, the book is very useful for you know just giving you background on the world. And then I would say start off with template characters. Uh, nothing wrong with using template characters. We set up uh, one template for every role in the uh, in the TRPG, and just do one of the um, every yeah. The book itself, uh, the at the not very end, but towards the end, has a series of, of what we call scream sheets, which are basically just little two page adventures that go over like, you know, just 
effectively like one one half session to one full session depending on how long your sessions are of content mm-hmm. like hey you need to you need to help this person who's being leaned on by a corporation and to do that you're going to have to go like rob a warehouse or something right. boom right that's your thing um all the players can get template characters um you can really easily get like i am a fixer i have this gun i have this special ability you know you are a solo you have these weapons you have this special ability everybody can get in really quick um and then from there you know i would if you've got the time i'd say we have a number of very good um actual plays that are uh called out on our website um so i might watch one of those mm-hmm. Or I just jump into it um, and, you know, see how you feel about the basic mechanics. Don't try to get too complicated. You don't have to use, like, rules for electrocution or, you know, anything too complex. The basic system is very simple. Um, And then if you really, like, if you enjoy that, then I would suggest whoever is the GM will want to sit down and read through the running cyberpunk section in the core book. Um, to just like get a vibe because we, we tried to really put a a whole chapter in this book that was just like, Hey, we know you may have never run cyberpunk before. If that's the case, here's a bunch of tips. Here's, here's how we suggest you do it. Here's what will make it easiest for you. There's actually a, there's actually a section in that chapter, which goes over what we call our beat chart, which is a, a step-by-step guide to building an adventure. Yeah, that's and, really cool. And 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 I would highly recommend watching uh, Mike D or GM DM. I do a Dungeons and Dragons lore cache also. Uh, <laughs> GM yeah, yeah. Uh, some of the stuff that's been up on on YouTube uh, recently, and get just get a sense of like even even the pacing of it, the way he describes a scenario. <laughs> like there's there's an art to being a good GM that goes beyond just crafting an adventure, right? It, it's it, it, you want to take your players and put them into the world and make it make it exciting for them. Oh yeah! And being able to watch somebody who has got, a lot of experience do that well is is a big help. If you if you want just like fast sort of one off stuff, um, I did two games with a group called Dice Breakers, um, which were just little. I think those were like three hour games. Um, they're very fast, very easy to kind of get into. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of good resources of people running the game that you can watch. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. So we're getting close to the end of the episode here. We got to we got to start wrapping wrapping it off. I've got um, some quick little questions to kind of work our way out real quick. Uh, We have a question here. I think Logan, I think you put this question in here. What is your favorite Mm -hmm. dystopian film? Oh, my favorite dystopian film. Oh, God. Um (laughs) That's actually really hard. I don't weirdly I don't watch a lot of of like traditionally dystopian films. Um and now my brain has gone entirely blank. <laughs> yeah. And all I can think about is BioShock. But um uh-huh. <laughs> I'm curious there's there's a ton out there that i i mean it's hard it would be hard for me to pick because i have so many uh you know like blade runner or ghost in the shell there's uh you know i would even throw like the fifth element in that in that situation just based on the 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 design of the city and stuff but there's so many dystopian films out there i'm I'll, i'll Part of this was a bait to try and understand a little bit about where you guys pull some of your resources. Cause I know Mike does his research, but the, the aesthetic and the design of a lot of the characters in red, uh, is, is definitely much more, um, kind of fleshed out than some of the artwork that was in some of the original books. And I'm just kind of curious cause I see things and I'm like, Oh, that kind of reminds me of Tron or, Oh, that kind of reminds me of uh, blade runner or that kind of reminds me of, you know, there's, name certain things. So I was curious. There's definitely, there's definitely a lot of blade runner, both, uh, both the original and 2049. Um, there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of Ghost in the Shell and standalone complex. There's a certain amount of Appleseed if you're yeah. familiar with that anime. Um, 
we actually have a we have a section in the book which I should probably if that's the case I for me I'm a big fan of Blade Runner I enjoyed I enjoyed watching um, the original um, anime film of of Ghost in the Shell and Sandalone Complex for the bits that I I did watch um, but. There's actually, and I can't find it right now because, of course, I can't. There's actually a section <laughs> in Cyberpunk Red where we talk about some of our inspirations, both book and film-wise, oh, cool. for Red. I will dig into that. It's in the GM section, I believe. Cool, cool. I'll, I will and, definitely look. Um, Kather, do you have any quick, real quick questions right here at the end? Um, I don't know if it's quick, but what's like your... What's one of the most memorable incidents you've had while making uh, Cyberpunk Red? Uh, okay, so <laughs> the the one that immediately springs to mind is that um, when we when me and James were doing game balance, because a lot of it came down to like Mike Mike would do the initial design, and then me and James would like fine tune little bits of it. And um, one of the we used to do uh, we used to do little combats in with uh, a a place we called balance town which is in the back of the office with a little thing set up for people to play the game to test it i want to go to balance town that sounds awesome <laughs> james is the yeah, mayor of balance town um we found out when we were doing balance back and forth we had one moment where we determined that grappling was far too strong because we determined we had a fight between two two edge runners and one of them ran up got shot took some damage but then grappled the other and on the next turn put them in a chokehold. And when you grapple somebody in red, you basically, they can't move away from you. You can move them with yourself. So, and when you choke, you deal your body stat in damage to them directly. Okay. Um, which when they hit zero hit points or below, they pass out and you can either let them be passed out or you can continue to choke them to death. But uh, this led to because the grapple rules were a little bit off, this led to one just running up and grabbing the other, putting them in a cho chokehold, and dragging them back into an alley and choking them to death. And the person, the other side, because the grapple rules were skewed, just could not break the grapple. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That's, that's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrestle my way out of every situation. <laughs> just like, Arr. It's like you may have the biggest Actually, best weapon, uh, but if I get if I grab a hold of you, you're, you're done. Yeah, it, it just goes to show oh, that jujitsu is the best of all martial arts. <laughs> grapples are grapples are terrible because you can once you grapple somebody, you can choke them, which does body damage every turn, or you can throw them, which knocks them prone and does body damage um, through armor. And this is great because it does mean that if you get into melee combat with somebody who is much bigger than you, you better be sure that you're faster than them. Um, I, I once had a character back in 2020 that I've kind of considered remaking for Red, who is named Arthritis Pain. Um, <laughs> That's great. And he, he was a professional wrestler working with a like a, almost like a, a traveling circus. And that character was great because they had an internal linear frame, so they were huge. And all of their their entire combat style was based around the fact that they had subdermal armor and a linear frame, and they did wrestling moves on people. Uh -huh. I imagine this is like the cartoon strongman suplex in like the like the uh, caveman like, like spotted Le leotard. He was, leotard. <laughs> yeah. he was no, he's actually Hand wildly. He was he was somewhere between. Uh, like classic lucha libre and booker t um and nice. where's the mask yeah oh my god that's great and it was great because Sorry. carrying forward into this game that would be a terrifying character because he'd have a body of 12 and could just like suplex people and do 12 points of damage right through their armor so not sure i've been to tempted brag. to bring that character into into red Oh my god, that's great! Can, we, Man, can he be like a, a can he be a, uh, a leader of, of at, yeah. like one of the animal clans or something? Like going into the future, like <laughs> yeah. oh, that would be amazing. Yeah. So I would love, I would love an expansion. I'm not that we've even had the time to really dig into everything in Red yet, but at some point, an expansion to Red that's like, like weirdos and offshoot characters, 
just like like this like weirdo gang of like character builds for people to just try out stuff like that that you guys have discovered and been like oh man this would be nuts if you had somebody who who did this or you know like the lucha libre guy or, yeah or you know and you could use them as like npcs in your campaign or you could play as them if you wanted to that would be really cool that'd be really oh, cool having like, a, like the justice league of weirdos just, just justice league of weirdos <laughs> yeah <laughs> have an entire like uh scream sheet of just all these off the wall off the wall combinations that you need like two or three people to be like there's no way you're going to be able to deal with this guy he's he's seriously got all the all the the edge runner features or net runner features to be able to hack you but he's also a huge huge animal it's like mega bosses <laughs> yeah we actually we toyed we toyed around with something that we're probably going to wind doing along the lines because I can't see us not. Which is a we did a we did a book for those unfamiliar with 2020 called Night City, which was a a world guide for Night City specifically. It went like street by street and told you what was going on in Night City and who all the gangs were and who all the key characters were. So we're probably going to wind up doing something similar to that for Red at some point. It's not officially in the pipe, but I can't imagine us not doing that book. Um, oh, and yeah. that would have a lot of those characters. We also have some stuff we're working on currently, which I can't talk about directly, which has a few of those characters in there that I'm really excited to see people interact with because they show up as one shot characters, but they're such good characters to just take and put into a campaign long term. Yeah. Yeah. I love that stuff. I love, I love the wacky off, off, you know, just really interesting bits of things you find in, in that kind of stuff. So good. Um, all right. Well, we're, we're really close to the end here. Last question. This comes from Herbert Small. He's one of our patrons. Favorite pizza toppings? Uh, chicken and bacon. Chicken and Sometimes bacon. Sometimes garlic. Ah, the chicken and pig combination, I see. Sometimes Surprisingly garlic. Surprisingly good. Surprisingly yeah, really good. good. Yeah. That is we really call good. it the, the barnyard pizza. Um, very nice. Well, thank you again, Cody, for joining us. And thank you, Kather, for for being here with us as well. Um, is there anything, uh, let's, let's start with Kather. Kather, is there any way that people can get a hold of you that you want to put out there other than on the discord? Um, uh, not really. I'm just most on the discord and stuff. Okay. Yeah. Just re- um, reach out on discord. You can, yeah, you're, you're Kather on there. So, um, and, and I have my, I have links to other stuff through discord. If I, you just click on the name and stuff. Yeah. All right, cool. So check that out. Make sure you're part of our community on Discord. We've got over, I don't know, 1,300 people on there or something like that at this point. Um, I think it was uh, 1,390 something. Holy crap. It was only, it was just a thousand like a month ago. It, it just keeps growing. Uh, so that's awesome. Cody, thank you again for joining us. This has been super fun. Um, is there anything you want to say before you head out? Anything you want to pitch or, or talk about or ways people can get a hold of you? Well, I mean, all I can say is uh, I'm I'm really excited to see people starting to play red. I'm really excited after all this time for it to get into people's hands. And uh, I I'm excited to start seeing people really talking about their campaigns. And I'm also trust me, everyone out there. I'm I'm just as excited for 2077 as you are. I'm losing my goddamn mind. <laughs> but, That's, uh, awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. You can. You can find uh, you can find us at artellstoryandgames.com. Uh, we have a blog site where we post sort of new information about stuff we're working on. We have a store site where you can get all our stuff. We also have you know Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and all that stuff. We have a really wonderful um, sort of community manager, social media manager, Jay Gray, who posts fun stuff on our Twitter all the time. Uh, so. Yeah. 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 We've had Jay on the show too. And we'll definitely have to touch base again sometime in the future to talk post 2077, your impressions of, of it and some of your adventures you went on. Oh, absolutely. And, and especially, uh, you know, once some of these things that you can't share about are actually a little bit more closer to release, then um, we'd love to hear about that as well. So thank you so much for joining us. All right. Uh, Cyberpunks, thank you for joining us as well. This is the end of the show. You guys know how to reach us. You, you know all the regular stuff. You've been listening for a while, but definitely reach out to us. We are always happy to talk cyberpunk and answer some questions and even just chat with you on our Discord. So come hang out with us. Check us out on Twitter, all the regular places. Everything's in the show notes. And until next time, stay safe in Night City. We'll see you guys later. Thank you. 
Thanks for tuning in to the Cyberpunk Lorecast. This show is a part of the Robots Radio Network, smart podcasts for interesting people. If you'd like to help support the show, please tell a friend and leave a five-star review on iTunes. If you'd like to get in contact, please send an email to cyberpunklorecast at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter at cyberpunklore. Also, join the community on the Robots Radio Discord. The link is in the show notes. The music on the show was written and performed by The Midnight and was used with their permission. Go check them out at themidnightofficial.com. Until next time, stay safe in Night City. We'll talk to you later. You've been listening to a Robots Radio podcast. Smart shows for interesting people. Check out all the shows at robotsradio.net.